Not a place I have to hide in. Life's not worth a damn till you can say, I am what I am. In this life, you often need an edge. And my guest today, not only does he have an edge, he is an edge. And it's my uh, good friend, Alan Edge. And Alan is not only uh, a lawyer, but he also is a councillor out right there on South Dublin Council, so, County Council. So, I was uh, of concern uh, during this age of COVID to your constituents out there in South Dublin, Alan. Well, I think a lot of the issues that are that are always there are still present, you know, so the council work is still going on. And as a councillor, I've been just amazingly busy, actually, um, mm. during the lockdowns, which has been kind of surprising. Um, I suppose one uh, big issue for me at the moment, uh, I'm involved in the new um, biodiversity subcommittee. Um, mm. And so um, we're looking to see how we can really um, push forward you know, more information about biodiversity and uh, all the work that's going on um, to try and protect and map and chart our biodiversity. And that'll all be linking up with the county development plan, which is kind of in the process now, the next county development plan. Um, and then some other issues, uh, you know, again, related to the environment, we're having serious issues with illegal dumping and littering, which I'm sure you've seen. I think it's everywhere. I think just, just in lockdown, it's been... Um, it's been a little epidemic of its own. Um, so uh, we, I've been working quite hard trying to, uh, you know, ensure that we get some enforcement on that. Mm -hmm. um, had some success the other day, actually. I was litter picking um, myself and found some uh, bags that had been dumped. And for fortunately, the, the dumper had left uh, some evidence of identification, including a Valentine's card. Uh. So... He'll be getting a not a, not a Valentine's card, but he'll be getting something else through the post. So yeah, on that one because it was an issue that uh, I had great concern with, particularly um, down the Fairview East Wall area. Um, there was a lot of dumping going on on the riverbank. What do you reckon? Is this uh, citizen dumping, or do you reckon it's organised in the sense that it's commercial? There's a mixture. There's definitely a mixture and um, there is, you know, there, there's a lot of, um, for example, littering that goes on around here up in the up in the Dublin mountains just that just comes from from people going to, um, you know, to enjoy themselves. Uh, lots of lots of bottles and cans and McDonald's wrappers and all that sort of thing. Um, but then there are professionals who are going to places, particularly places. Um, it, I, I, it seems, you know, where there's sort of disadvantage and there's problems with litter connections and stuff like that and they're saying give me you know x amount of euro and i'll take it away from you yeah. and they they drive it up into the hills or they drive it to the nearest uh, sort of deserted spot and uh, and dump it so um there's definitely people making money out of it um mm -hmm. but uh you know i'm working with the council to see what we can do i'm very i'm kind of very confident actually that we are going to get some tougher enforcement going on because i think we really need to start penalizing some of these people you know sure yeah is it education really uh, the issue there? And I know we always say that that's the key to everything or the solution to everything, but uh, is education the issue to, uh, to get people to take on board that you have a civic responsibility uh, in, in relation to this, even if you're making a few bob out of it? I think to some extent it is. And, and you know, you mentioned education as well. Uh, you know, weirdly, it's, it's like it skipped a generation because you have these kids uh, who, are, who are just amazing. We've got this amazing... Um, uh, I think he's eight now in the in the valley, and he um, litter picks with his mom every week, and he's just so knowledgeable about recycling. Not only does he kind of spend his free time litter picking, but he can tell you exactly what you can recycle. And he's like, "No, you shouldn't. You should be dismantling whatever it is because it's a compound thing." And so, you know, in terms of education going forward, I think there's a lot to be optimistic about. But there is that yeah. cohort that that don't see you know, the beauty and the biodiversity of somewhere like, the, you know, somewhere like here, like the Glenna Small Valley, they, they just see an opportunity. So there is education, um, education and enforcement, I think. I think we really have to be, we have to be, you know, uh, catching some of these guys. <laughs> On that basis, because I know that you've got a background in the uh, environment, in the environmental movement. Um, when uh, I found, 
a few years ago, I did uh, some photographs down in Fairview Park. And what we discovered was is that um, uh, particularly when the feud started uh, between the Kinahans and the Hutches, suddenly the dealing moved from the south inner, the north inner city back over to the park. So what, you, what I was finding was, I'm not joking you, literally hundreds of syringes. So mm -hmm. rather than go on radio and make a, uh, a palaver about it, I took photographs and I posted them on social media. Now it took a while, but Dublin City Council did something about it and all the syringes moved. And then uh, other people came to me and said, we're having that problem in our park. But what I noticed, and this is really interesting, is that we got rid of one drug, which was heroin, uh, yeah. And we substituted it with another, which was alcohol. So now if you go down to these areas, the littering is not syringes anymore, but mm -hmm. it's, Bottle. it, well, it's bottles and cans. Mm -hmm. From uh, an environmental perspective, corporations don't care. Um, they, you know, you're wasting your time trying to educate them. Do you think we should be putting charges on things like uh, beer cans and beer bottles to give people an incentive? Absolutely. I think it's a great idea. I think this idea of, you know, incentives to recycle is definitely, I mean, you know, they do it in Germany with great success. Um, mm. you, you see it in Berlin where, uh, you know, people are, you know, genuinely making making enough money to um, to mm. keep to keep going by recycling. So definitely that's part of the strategy, I think. Um, yeah, no, absolutely. I think fortunately, um, you know, there are, well, there are a lot of sort of drinking dens throughout our, our parks yeah. here in South but we have a fantastic sort of army of volunteers mm -hmm. um, who, who go in to tackle these places. Yeah. Um, funny you were saying, uh, you know, talking about the sort of drugs epidemic, though, another big issue that I've been dealing with lately, um, I'm, I'm on the um, Tala Drug and Alcohol Task Force, and we have a really serious uh, problem at the moment with um, crack, with crack cocaine, and the, the impacts that that's having on people and people's daily lives. Mm -hmm. There really is just a sort of a huge blind spot, I think, when it comes to the national government mm -hmm. about dealing with this issue and, you know, really a sense that some of these um, these areas which are, are really, really suffering mm -hmm. under the weight of this problem uh, are being totally ignored. You know, there's no funding, mm -hmm. um, very little, everything they have to fight for tooth and nail. Um, the, the service providers trying to tackle it. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, that's that's a huge issue for us as well. And obviously, I think lockdown, with all its impacts on people's mental health, really exacerbates um, issues like that as well. So um, yeah. it's interesting yeah. you should say that because um, when I started in radio 20 years ago, there was virtually no cocaine in Dublin. Now you're falling over it. Um, now, crack is a well, we know it's a uh, it's a derivative of cocaine. It's a particular uh, um, uh, form of pure form of cocaine. Uh, the experience in the U.S. is that it tends to disproportionately affect disadvantaged areas for the simple reason is that if you want to buy a gram of cocaine, for instance, it can cost you sixty to eighty euros. That's a, say, a bit of an outlay. But if you want to buy a, a rock, as they say. You could probably get one for about a fiver. And that was always the problem, particularly in the inner cities in the US. Is that what you're finding out there? Because crack, ha crack hasn't been a problem here uh, up to, I, I hadn't really heard of it up to about two years ago. Now I'm hearing of it in quite a lot of places, always in disadvantaged areas. Absolutely. That's absolutely it, Mick. And it is, it is a fairly recent, but, but very rapidly developing um, problem. And it is, um, you know, disadvantaged uh, communities that are really suffering and, you know, huge issues with drug debt. Um, there, there was an article done recently talking to, you know, talking to people on the front line, as I say, I'm, I'm just there as an elected rep um, who are, are dealing with, um, you know, a, a lot of um, transactional sex happening as a result of, of drug debts, yep. specifically due to this crack problem. So it's... <laughs> It's it's a massive problem, and 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 you know uh, poverty and 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 crack seem to go together. Yeah. yeah. Can I just put just slightly to digress, Alan, because you and I uh, know quite a bit about the LGBT scene. Um, so, something I'm not hearing quite as much about uh, this year as I would have been, say, a year or eighteen months ago, was chemsex. Um, where people were basically going out there, getting ripped, and then, as we say getting up and getting down for most of the weekend um, and people were dying is, has that come on your radar in the uh, uh or is that really um 
shall we say, an inner city sort of a city sort of thing amongst the middle classes. I don't. I, I again, I don't think it is. I don't think it's possible or, or safe to kind of assume that it's a that it's a city thing but I know a lot of fantastic work has been done mm-hmm. um, you know and empower and the rapid testing uh, mm-hmm. and all of that have been doing great work I think just in in terms of raising awareness of the risks mm-hmm. in a kind of very non-judgmental way as well and saying look uh, you know this is what you need to be doing to to ensure that your your sex is safe whatever you're whatever you're doing so um, I think there has been a little bit of a, um, you know, a, a little bit of not demystifying, but you know, a little bit of a, a destigmatizing maybe, and a little bit more of a conversation happening okay. around, which I think has been useful. But um, definitely, like anything, Mick, I think the problem is that everything is focused on the city centre. Yeah. And you know, when you're talking about it's a big old place, Greater Dublin, you know. Oh and, yeah. You know, yeah. When you're talking about a, a county like ours, um, you know, uh, and this is something I know we're going to be talking about, but uh, you've got one of the highest, if not the highest, yes vote in the marriage equality referendum, parts of Tala, and yet there is nothing by way of infrastructure for the LGBT okay. plus community. Do you know what I mean? So there's sure. there's nothing, there's no awareness. Um, and a very good example um, because I was talking to a pharmacist about this the other day, mm-hmm. is PrEP, you know? So obviously, oh, yeah. you know, huge development, um, uh, you know, in recent years has been the availability of PrEP and the the fact that now people can get PrEP, can access PrEP on the drug payment scheme. Mm-hmm. But if you go outside the centre of Dublin, I don't know how many pharmacists you're going to find who know that or who yeah. know mm-hmm. who know much about PrEP or who know much about the sort of, you know, the people who will be, who'll be looking for PrEP and the fact that you know they are um they're not just living in the city center yep 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 uh, coming to that one alan uh, because uh, i've been trying to promote oh, <coughs> excuse me awareness of prep and, and certainly awareness of hiv now uh, we would both accept there is no cure, but there is a, you can manage it. But even um, on the drug payment, uh, or the, the, the drug refunding scheme, it's still a significant outlay. Um, and one of the problems, uh, which I'm discovering with the HSE, is that, okay, they say you don't have to pay more than, I think it's 114 euros a month. Um, but if you've got to pay out two or 300 at a time, uh, and then to get that back, uh, that's quite an outlay if you're on, say, a uh, uh, on a social welfare payment or on a pension, even. Yeah, yeah, um, absolutely. Is that something that the uh, the minister, both the minister for finance and the minister for health, need to take on board because it um, it's not uh, it, it's not simply uh, good mm. enough for to have bean counters making um, um, uh, certainly medical policy. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Like, I, I, I think you raise a really, really good point. And um, I think it definitely is an issue for them to address. But I think more than that, it's an issue that requires more engagement generally. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I think I think there is, um, you know, we have, as I said, we have fantastic sort of NGOs doing a lot of great work and all that sort of thing. Mm. But it is down to these individuals, uh, mm. it seems, rather than necessarily the HSE saying, this yeah. is the message, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, so yes, definitely. I think it all needs to be looked at, and it needs and, and more focus needs to be given, particularly on the communication and something. Um, uh, particularly when it comes to uh, um, talking about crack and talking about uh, HIV, we generally assume that these are, if you like, male preserves. What's your experience out there? Is it um, is, are, are females being affected, particularly with crack? Um, that um, uh, that sometimes that sneaks up uh, uh, below the radar, and it's only when we um, uh, it's only when we hear about these things, it's often too late. And if you see the uh, the situation in the inner cities in the U.S., it, it creates havoc amongst uh, uh, women. And as you say about transactional sex, absolutely, yeah. I mean, that's that's the information that's um, that's coming to us. And as I say, you know, the great work of of um, you know, the frontline and um, people who are working with um, with the users and helping them during the pandemic. Um, that does seem to be anecdotally, you know, what's coming back is that it's it, it's it's certainly not just men. Um, but, you know, in terms of the the impact, 
particularly, I suppose, the financial dynamic, it's having an effect. It's, it's no exaggeration. It's having an effect on entire communities. You know, mm-hmm. it really is. It, it, it is. It is crippling them. There's, yep. there's no word for it. Yeah. Um, and, and they're being ignored, um, yeah. unfortunately, by the, you know, by the government who perhaps well intended, but they've shown no, um, they've shown no real commitment, I think, to actually grappling with the problem and to working with the front line who, yeah. who know what they're talking about and who know the extent of the issue that they're dealing with in areas like Tala. Yeah. I'm just going to uh, put you on the spot very briefly Ooh. here because you're a man who has a legal background. Um, and I was just saying it to somebody today. Um, it's almost 50 years, it's 50, close enough to 50 years since um, Richard Nixon started his war on drugs. And it was very much a, um, uh, how can I put it? It was very much a policing approach and medical uh, uh was minor. Um, what's your thoughts uh, of what we've learned over the period? Do you think we've got that balance? Uh, uh, it, it's got a bit askew uh, between, uh, pro- uh, shall we say, prohibition and medical. <coughs> oh, right. Bless me. Yep. <coughs> oh, yep. So, what's your thoughts on that, Alan? Um, <clears throat> well, I think. My own view is that prohibition, quite apart from, you know, the kind of wider debate about it, it doesn't work. Yeah, it doesn't work. It has never worked. Yeah. Uh, I think from the from the outset, I think it was a um, a political rather than a practical approach. Do you know what I mean? It was a kind of tough law and order policy uh, position rather than anything else. And I think. I can't speak for for the Gardaí, but certainly having worked in the criminal justice system in the UK, I think there's definitely an awareness that it was an unwinnable fight. And also um, that the people who benefit most from prohibition, uh, you know, as it was in the in the States in the 20s with alcohol, the people who benefit most are the gangs, the people, you know, they're, they're the people who are um, who are making the money out of it. And they're, you know, really profiting out of human misery. So I don't think it works. Um and but at the same time you know uh, how does one adopt a different approach you know uh, you could look at uh, a model something like they have in portugal i'm not su- suggesting it's the only model or the best model but um you know there, there is some data to show that that's been working and i think really the 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 key and i think probably everywhere is seeing this focus shifting away from penalizing the the end users who are really the victims yeah. of 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 the, the sort of kingpins and and the gangs yeah. um, and and to shift focus onto the onto the uh the commercial side yeah yeah exactly. yeah, yeah. Just, uh, I don't want to labour this, but just to conclude on this point, Alan, do you also find that, uh, like you were saying earlier, it disproportionately affects people who are disadvantaged? Because I've been saying on this programme and other programmes for a considerable period of time, um, if you've got a cocaine problem in Dorky, you're probably okay. But if you've got a cocaine problem in Tala, you're probably going to end up in uh, Wheatfield Prison. Mm. Absolutely. That's absolutely it. I mean, you know, we know that the, that that the two are index linked and i think probably you know as well just looking at the link um in wider terms in terms of people's mental health um and the economic disadvantage you know i mean that's that's demonstrable it's there for all to see um so yeah i think that's absolutely right i think there's no question that it has a disproportionate impact and also i think if we were sitting here talking about a crack problem in dorky uh, it would be fixed by now. You know? <laughs> yeah, I, think yeah. we'd, I think we'd have seen ministerial action on it. Yeah. Uh, but West Calla, no, not so, not so bothered. Yep. So you know, there's there's that inequality as well. Yep. Alan, let's move on to what was the uh, the primary focus for grabbing you today, which is the Southwest LGBT uh, um, Q network. Um, what's the? How long has it been going, and what was your original uh, thinking when you set it up? So it's been going since last summer, um, and uh, we've actually had a name change, which I was, uh, which is which is uh, hot off the press, <laughs> which I've come to. Um, but I, I sort of set it up. Um, you know the way it is. You're kind of looking for something yourself. You know what? Where where is where is the LGBT plus community? Am I missing 
something. Do you know what I mean? Because this is a big county. As I say, huge numbers voted yes in, in the marriage equality referendum. So, um, I, you know, many of them allies and so on, but not all of them. You know, you're talking about uh, certainly a huge cohort of population. Um, and, uh, and, and I was sort of wondering, well, where are they? And um, I, I couldn't find anyone. Mm-hmm. Um, so I set up with a, with a, a couple of other people um, this group is a private Facebook group. Sure. <clears throat> Obviously, I think in, in lockdown... You have to so start many, somewhere. Yeah. You have to start somewhere. And, you know, events are just really out of the, out of the you know, yeah. uh, out of the question for a minute. So got a great response. Mm-hmm. Um, and I started it, you know, I just shared it, obviously, on my, my political page and my personal page and, and word spread a little bit. And uh, we did a survey as well, just saying, you know, hi, how do you identify and where, which part of the county do you live in? And, you know, are, are there uh, services available, do you find? And the answer to that was universally no, there's nothing. Mm-hmm. There is literally nothing. Now, the only thing, um, for OIGA do some great work in association with Belong to um, for, for LGBT plus youth, and that's great. But for everybody else, mm-hmm. there's nothing. Um, so, uh, so that was something that was really striking. Um, and we asked people as well, you know, what do you want to see? What would you like this group to be for? Would you like it to be for advocacy? Would you like it to be for socializing? Would you like it to be for networking? What? So, you know, sort of socializing, networking, um, and really just the sense of community. That was the mm-hmm. feedback. Yeah. Um, so the group was, was, was kind of a building in numbers. Um, and uh, we did have, we, we, we had an event <laughs> where four of us went out in, in a lull. I can't even remember, re- remember when it was now, you know, because time just has lost all meaning um, in the middle of all the lockdowns. But when we had it, we, we were at level three. So we went for an outdoor uh, uh, within our, within our uh, area. And, you know, that was, that was grand. Um, we then had some events for Social Inclusion Week. Um, and again, some you know people people were uh, enthused about that. We had a sort of Zoom class, and um, but more importantly, really, it's just been about um, keeping people informed and keeping people connected. I think just just building that connection. Mm-hmm. Um, but then, kind of quite separately to what I was doing, the council, <clears throat> South Dublin County Council, had been looking to. Um, to do something to ensure that the LGBT plus community was being recognized uh, countywide. Um, so uh, that, th- that was a sort of separate piece of work they were doing. And I think um, it, it, it's, it's a community that's been overlooked and there's an awareness that it's been overlooked and certainly a real genuine desire in the council to mm. address that, but maybe not any clear idea of how to do that. Yeah. So I've been working with them now um, and uh, as a result, we're expanding the group, which is really exciting. Okay. A couple of things, Alan, uh, just listening to you uh, speaking there. Uh, I've been involved with South Dublin County Council on this area, not this year, but uh, in, in the previous year, because South Dublin County Council are only the second county, local, author, local government authority in the country to have an LGBT staff network. Um, and they all, uh, South Dublin County Council also have extremely good support for the LGBT community in the libraries. So mm, yes. there is a base there to build upon. Um, but what I wanted to ask you is, I started to, um, if you like, highlight LGBTQ issues when I was working out in Coolock because I came to the conclusion that it's probably not that difficult to be LGBT and uh, um, even coming out if you lived in Ranelow, Rathmines, or Clontarf, or some of these areas. Mm. However, it was a bit difficult. Uh, what I came across at the time was in places like Coolock. Uh, there were a lot of LGBT people, just like you have out there in Tala and all of those other areas. Um, that it was a, uh, there was more of a need to, uh, shall we say, to show visible support and rigid, robust support. Is that some of your thinking uh, behind this network? 
Definitely, absolutely, and uh, and yeah, Liz, you're right to bring up the um, the the uh, network within the council, which is fantastic, and it I know that they're good, amazing, yeah. amazing network as well in Dublin City Council. So it's great to see that there's um, that there's an overlap there as well. Um, yeah, no, that's exactly it, Mick. And I think um, I think there's been a perception for a long time that if you're in whether it's South Dublin or you know Dunleary Rath Down or Fingal or wherever, that I would sure you have town, you know. So if you need if you need a scene or if you need uh, those services that we as LGBT plus people need, then then that's available to you. And the reality is. It's a big old geographic area. People from yeah. from I don't do their socialising in town um, necessarily, and and yeah. certainly you know people from Glendalk and further out. So um, it's it, it, you know I think there's a huge there's been a huge um, underestimation of the need for you know it's kind of bizarre that uh, a county the size of South Dublin. Um, has had no kind of pride uh, festival of its own, and yet you know we have pride parades now in places like Arklo, which is terrific. Mm. Yes, I, I was going to ask you about that because a few years ago, a, uh, a former uh, chair of South Dublin County Council, Dermot Looney, proposed mm. having a uh, a pride for uh, for South Dublin. Um, is that something you would welcome? Absolutely, absolutely, and it's something we're we're actively looking at. Um, Actually, last year I, I have, you know, I've been speaking to to Dublin Pride, and Dublin Pride, you know, are, are amazing. They're they're very very keen, mm -hmm. I think, and, and would be a driving force uh, behind trying to, um, you know, regionalize uh, to some extent, but to, to ensure that areas of Dublin that have been left out um, are, you know, represented. Mm -hmm. um, so they've been amazing, and I was having some chats with them at the start of last year, mm -hmm. and I actually spoke to the director of, uh, you know, community in South Dublin County Council, probably around February, I, I took him aside during a council mm -hmm. meeting and I said, look, this is what I want to do this year. I want to do a sort of pride event. And then I said, almost as an afterthought, provided this COVID thing doesn't escalate and, yeah. and everything, also, yeah. ho, 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 you know, yeah. and, and that was, you know, famous last word. So um, there's definitely an appetite there. Uh, you know, Dublin Pride, I think, are, are fantastically supportive. Um, so I, I hope that this will be the start of, um, you know, definitely having having pr pride in South Dublin and um, having pride events, maybe even our own little mini pride festival. I think that's definitely something that this group and that I am um, I'm, I'm looking to work towards. Well, you'd be pleased to know um, when I was uh, involved with another NGO, oh, must be nine years ago now, we had Northside Pride. Um, that was driven by the uh, Arte and Kula Family Resource Centre. So it is possible uh, you can have a couple of events that are specifically targeted uh, or uh, focused on the local people. But before we conclude today, Alan, because I know we're, I'm conscious of running out of time, there's an event that you've been uh, highlighting that's been organised by Faroiga. Um, can you tell us about that? Mm -hmm. Well, it's. I, I know that Faroiga are um, working with with belong to, and they are seeking input from. I think it's eighteen to to twenty four year olds. Fifteen to twenty four. Fifteen. Sorry, fifteen to twenty four. Yeah. Um, which I think is, you know, it, it's really good. I particularly because the voices of of, of that age category are often not heard uh, during mm -hmm. lockdown. Um, so I, I think it, it's amazing. I was, you know, happy to share it in the in the group. Um, I think particularly because uh, our group is not a it's not a moderated group, so it's uh, eighteen and upwards, um, and you know very very conscious of of you know those extremely difficult uh, kind of teenage years where people need that support. So mm -hmm. I, I think it's really great to see Faroiga and belong to um, you know continuing to do some some sort of outreach work there to try and reach people, mm -hmm. um, young people. Um, who really, really need that support at the moment. Yeah, yeah. Where would be the best place for people to get that information? Should they go to the Faroiga website themselves? Yep, you'll find it on the Faroiga on the Faroiga uh, website and on their Facebook page uh, is where I found it. Um, mm -hmm. If people are on Facebook, and I don't have the, I don't know their their other yeah, social yeah. media details, but but definitely the Faroiga page has it, oh, yeah. um, and uh, you know, well worth sharing, spreading the word about. Alan, unfortunately, we've run out of time. It is always great to catch up with you. So while we have this virus uh, or uh, kicking in there, all I can say is stay safe and stay fabulous. 
You too, Mick. <laughs> Absolutely. Keep safe. Yep. Thank you, Alan. Uh, that's Alan Edge. And uh, we look forward to talking to Alan again. Take care. It's my world that I want to have a little pride in. My world, and it's not a place I have to hide in. Life's not worth a damn till you can say I am.